good evening to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to come out to our budget hearing. I'm Deanna Jonovich, Assistant City Manager, and before we start, I'm going to introduce our translator in case there's anybody here tonight that needs a translator. Carmen Barajas, an interpreter. Um, soy Carmen Barajas, se ocupa intérprete, acérquese acá. Uh, Councilwoman Pastor is on her way, and so we're just going to walk through a couple things, watch the video, and then she'll be here in plenty of time for all of the public comment to get all of your feedback. So, as many of you may know, if you've attended another budget hearing, this is our budget where we go out, we try to get uh, community input from our residents on what we have in the proposed budget so that we can go back to council with all of the input that we received. It is one of 19 citywide hearings that we're doing this year. And so part of what we're gonna do tonight is show a short video. I'm hoping as everybody came in, they picked up the booklet that gives you all of the information of what's being proposed in the budget this year. Um, and so we'll do the short video. Once a councilwoman arrives, we'll start with the public comments. Anybody that's here to make comments, if you can pick up a card and make sure you fill out the card, and then we'll do those in order as we received them tonight. So with that, we will show the video. Welcome to your first look at the City of Phoenix trial budget for 2019-20, proposed by the City Manager for public review and comment. The City budget is about people and programs for a stronger Phoenix. Every year, the City prepares a trial budget. This process gives you, our residents, an opportunity to share your priorities and feedback on how tax dollars are spent three important points about this year's budget. It is balanced, which is required by law, and there is a surplus to allocate toward people and programs. Also, for the first time since the recession, ongoing revenues are equal to ongoing costs. We have a nearly $1.4 billion structurally balanced general fund budget thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council. These efforts have led to a projected surplus of $55 million, of which $35 million is in ongoing resources and $20 million is in one-time resources. Over the next several minutes, we'll provide you a high-level view of the recommendations for how that surplus could be spent. Approximately 70% of the surplus is proposed for employee compensation, and the remaining 30% is proposed for services and $5.5 million to continue investing in the Public Safety Pension Reserve Trust Fund to protect against unexpected downturns in investments. The 2019-20 trial budget continues to provide the core services residents expect. Chief among these is public safety. In addition, many recommendations are focused on improving neighborhoods, parks, libraries, support for outreach and services for people experiencing homelessness, additional street landscape maintenance, and preparations for the 2020 census. The city also continues to invest in maintaining the facilities you depend on and the fleet of vehicles that provide you everything from police response to street cleanups. Besides these proposals, we'll highlight expenditures that help the city address growth in construction and maintain the city's wastewater infrastructure. First, general fund recommendations. The general fund is made up of several different sources of revenue, including sales taxes, state shared revenue, and property taxes. Three-fourths of the general fund pays for police, fire, and courts, with a smaller portion, the remaining 25%, going for everything else, like libraries, parks, senior services, arts and administrative and support functions. The primary focus of the general fund service additions is public safety across a wide array of departments. Here are some of the proposals. Eight new firefighter positions to provide 24-hour operations at Fire Station 55 at I-17 and Jomax Road in North Phoenix. 
add funding for seven sworn fire positions, creating a new ambulance rescue unit at Fire Station 58 to improve emergency response times in Southwest Phoenix. The creation of one new fire department crisis intervention unit and in the police department, de-escalation training and community response services support for officer-involved shootings. These recommendations are based on public feedback from last year's budget process and the city's Traumatic Incident Intervention Resources Ad Hoc Committee. Another key area of public safety funding is focused on improving police support processes, using civilian staff to free up police officers' valuable time for calls and service. First, the addition of 10 civilian positions to support a federally mandated transition to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting National Incident-Based Reporting System. And second, the addition of 13 positions to streamline police booking procedures and create two new centralized booking centers to get officers back on the street faster. The trial budget also provides funding for increased inspection capacity to ensure buildings are meeting fire safety codes. Other public safety allocations, public defender representation for veterans and individuals with mental illness. In human services, add a caseworker and a vehicle to provide mobile victim advocacy. Security guard staffing at every library. Technology funding for cybersecurity to protect the city's infrastructure. In all, the trial budget proposes spending an additional $6.5 million on these and other public safety additions. Now, let's look at where you live, investments in programs to strengthen neighborhoods. First, the budget would allocate approximately $1 million to add staff to work with neighborhood groups, to clean up blight, work with nearby businesses, and improve response times for neighborhood issues. Parks and Recreation would see eight new park ranger positions to increase patrol coverage at neighborhood and urban parks for a cost of about $1.1 million. Street transportation and public works would support neighborhoods by transitioning staff from a temporary to permanent status to clean up encampments and washes and right-of-way for a cost of $970,000. Historic preservation would also get $75,000 to support historic property preservation. In all, neighborhood revitalization would see an additional $3.5 million in funding. Next, community services additions restore some desired programs to strengthen the community and expand other resident requests, including restoration of Sunday library hours at four branches means all libraries will be open to provide greater access to in-demand books, movies, classes, and programs for library patrons of all ages. Expand the Phoenix Teens program for youth at 10 city sites providing youth programs six days per week at a cost of $448,000. Providing case management assistance for homeless seniors and grant funding for arts organizations for youth and underserved communities would also be included. The budget would also add $1.3 million for long-standing street landscape maintenance needs, increasing frequency of maintenance from three to four times per year. New this year, a proposal to allocate funding to implement participatory budgeting or other projects in city council districts. Lastly, the city will invest in outreach to encourage residents to take part in the 2020 census. Given the move to digital form submission this census, the additional funds will help to ensure hard to count and hard to reach populations participate so that Phoenix gets its fair share of the approximately $866 million in annual revenues allocated through federal programs for public safety, transportation, housing, and human services. Overall, added general fund expenditures outlined in the trial budget total $55.2 million and would add 131 positions to strengthen our people, programs, services, and infrastructure. Moving on to propose non-general fund additions for a variety of services. 
strengthening our street transportation department with 11 positions added or converted to full time for a variety of services to support increasing work in the right of way and the recently expanded street maintenance funding in the capital improvement program budget, $768,000. Water services will see 21 positions and approximately $2.9 million in funding to keep up with demand at the department's 91st Avenue treatment site, the state's largest. The site is currently treating 180 million gallons of water a day for more than 2.5 million residents in five cities. Finally, 19 positions for planning and development to address increasing construction demand, including reduction of turnaround times for pre-application submittals and complex commercial architectural plans. Added staff to ensure adherence to fire system requirements and ADA accessibility codes, and to maintain a 24-hour turnaround time for residential inspections. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the 2019-20 trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget pamphlet available at one of our 19 community budget hearings and online at phoenix.gov budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at a public meeting or via email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. You can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. Thank you for being part of this important process. So that gives you a little bit of an overview on what we're proposing in this year's budget. A lot of the things that we are proposing uh, also came out of last year's feedback that we heard at the budget hearings. We talked a little bit about the traumatic incidents and that ad hoc committee was created. And so through that process, that was something that occurred at last year's budget hearing. We also heard about fire staffing and seniors and homelessness and libraries. So we tried to incorporate in a lot of that as well. So this process is meaningful to the city to get your input and feedback. Jeff Barton is our budget and research director. And so I'm going to have him walk through a little bit about the process we walk through and some of the additional information that's included. Thank you, Deanna. Um, so again, today, many of you have been to a budget hearing before. And so this is just one of the next steps in our process, and I'll kind of walk you through briefly how we get to this point. Um, so one of the first things we do with the city council is we walk them through what is considered our five-year forecast, where we determine how much resources we have, not just available for this year, but also for the, four base, for the four out years, to determine whether or not we have the resources to be able to sustain some of the programs that we're talking about adding. And so this year's five-year forecast was a very big improvement over the past couple of five-year forecasts that we've had. We've had a lot of negative numbers, a lot of red numbers to deal with coming out of the economy um, and the recession. It's taken us a really long time to recover and rebound, but we have rebounded. Um, this five-year forecast was very important to us because we actually were able to demonstrate that we are structurally balanced, meaning that the services that we provide on a daily basis every year we have the annual revenue to support and continue those programs and continue those services without necessarily having to rely on one-time resources to get us through. And so that's something that we haven't had in quite a long time coming out of the recession. So that was really big. One of the other things that we wanted to do with the council this year was really determine how much of our resources were available for ongoing versus how much of it was one time. So you'll see in this video as well as in this tabloid, um, we actually have $55 million in surplus, but we distinguish between the two um, there's a distinction between the $55 million. So about $35 million of that is ongoing. So that's money that can be used to sustain ongoing programs, ongoing services, as well as dealing with our employees from compensation standpoint. And then there's about $20 million worth of services that we can use that are one time in nature. And so those are things that we can't continue in perpetuity. They, they avail themselves to just being spent one time. We can't continue them. If we do, then it creates a structural challenge for us. So a lot of what we're adding in this year's budget, as Deanna said, the, there are things that we've, we've talked about in the past, things we've heard from the community in the past, um, as well as trying to restore some of those vital programs that were cut during the Great Recession. 
So during the recession, there was at least 25 to $30 million worth of direct services to our residents that have not yet been restored. And in this process, you, you see that we're, we're able to restore some, but not all. So we're restoring about $16 million worth of those services. And again, it's going to be a, it's baby steps. We'll eventually get there. Um, the other thing that we talked to the council about at length in our budget development process is, again, just being prepared for the future. And, and knowing that there is more than likely a softening in the economy, there is more than likely going to be a recession at some point very shortly. Um, so I'm watching that every day, probably scaring most people that I talk to on a daily basis about it, but it's reality. And it's just a part of the normal business cycle within the United States. Um, so it's nothing to get scared of, it's just something that you've got to prepare for. And so that's my job, to try and prepare the council and to prepare my counterparts in the city um, to prepare for those types of things. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Laura, and the time is now yours. And I'm glad you finished the video. I watched that, yes, I watched that video about five or six times. Uh, Issa Hill, if you can uh, come speak. And then right after that is Eduardo Pim. I know I always mistake that name, but where is he? He's right here. Go ahead. Um, hello, um, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Councilwoman Pastor and the other representatives from the city um, for being here today and to also thank uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital for hosting the, the hearing. Um, my name is Isa Skill um, and I work with the formerly incarcerated and a population along with their impacted family members. Um, and I've seen firsthand the consequences of living within a city and a system that criminalizes individuals who are desperate for help. Um, I can tell you that unfortunately we incarcerate a great deal of our city's ills. Uh, many of the people that are behind bars are behind the bars because of social issues such as homelessness, mental illness, addiction, and so on. And it's for these reasons and many more that I'm here uh, to demand as an activist and as a voter uh, that the city invest in health and well-being of our communities and neighborhoods. Specifically, um, I ask first that the city invest in affordable housing. Unfortunately, this is a big issue, particularly when it comes to reentry in the prison population. But as it stands, Phoenix currently ranks near the bottom of all U.S. major cities in the availability of affordable housing. And a person earning minimum wage would have to work 56 hours a week to afford a one-bedroom apartment in our city. I just don't think that's reasonable. Um, secondly, I ask that the city invest in health, nutrition, and housing services for people in our communities, um, particularly children and families who are um, desperate for those needs. Third, I ask that the city invest in additional programs for youth, including after-school enrichment, sports programs, job training, and low-cost child care. Fourth, uh, I ask that the city invest in resources that support and expand access to mental health services to reduce the months-long wait uh, times facing people who need treatment. Um, and lastly, um, this ask is specifically to Councilwoman Pastor. Um, in 2016, the City Council um, passed a municipal ID to help address a lot of the issues that are facing our most vulnerable in our communities. Um, I ask that if you could please look into getting this program off the ground. It's something that in, now in our particular climate is just as necessary, if not more vital. Um, if there's question as to where the funding for these initiatives will come from, um, I, I believe that the conversation should start by stipulating a freeze on any new taxpayer money for the Phoenix Police Department. 43% of our city's general funds go to the Phoenix Police Department, which is about 10 to 20% more than other major municipalities. And in 2018, Phoenix led the nation in officer-involved shootings, despite, the fact, uh, despite this fact, the Phoenix Police Department has been resistant even to the most basic civilian oversight and accountability measures. Therefore, I do not support giving any additional funding to a police department that has proven itself to be both deadly and averse to public accountability. Instead, my request is that the public monies um, be spent on programs that ensure basic needs for all our members and that our community needs are met. Thank you so much. Thank you. So in affordable housing, we are right now in a, a process uh, with uh, developers and nonprofits, we're building a collective impact regarding affordable housing. Um, the private industry uh, has, has come to us and said, we know that there's a need for affordable housing and we would like to participate and build a fund uh, regarding every, I can't remember the exact amount, but everything uh, that is built 
then there will be some uh, money placed in this fund in order to look at affordable housing. As for youth programs, uh, youth programs are, I would say we probably really need to build a robust youth program. Uh, we have after school or after school uh, care, I don't I wanna say programs, but we probably really need to look at that and really make it a robust uh, program. I would like to see more steam in there. As for mental health, uh, mental health, this is a debate that's going on with the city, the county, and the state because technically the city is not part of putting money into mental health. It's usually the state behavioral health funding comes from the state and also from the county. So that's a larger conversation to have. Um, as for the ID program, money was set aside for the ID program. The ID program was moving forward. And uh, then due to the third party, there was a number of issues happening with the ID program and the third party. And so that's where it stalled. Um, it also stalled within the community and it just stopped. So if the ID program wants to come back, um, my suggestion, or may I suggest, that that dialogue start uh, with the city again, and uh, money was allocated to that program, uh, but due to the fact that it didn't get up and go, uh, the money was reallocated. So, Edward Pym. Kind of. It's okay. I guess I'll just say. My name is Eduardo, and uh, I've been coming to these community meetings, community budget hearings uh, for the past week, week and a half, and I've been pretty much saying the same thing that we need we need to do better as a city to fill these seats. I believe the council should have a quota to fill these seats, and maybe picking up some of the organizing tactics that the community uses, like canvassing and um, street teaming and stuff like that, uh, to fill these seats to get the community to out to do outreach to the community to let them know about the budget process. Uh, we recently surveyed the community, and I believe like 70 percent or something like that didn't know uh, that you guys had these meetings. Um, so that's. That's one thing I'd like to say about this process. Uh, another thing I'd like to say um, is that we should have a quarterly report on how the money is spent and in which district, because a lot of times we find ourselves going to city council and asking, um, oh, we, we, uh, the community asked for trees, and then you, know, you guys approve it, and then we ask, wh where, was, where were these trees planted? You know, what, how was this money spent? And then there's always like, oh, well, we don't know. We'll find out. But, you know, so if there's some sort of receipt that the community could look at to, as to how the money was spent. And, um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks. So are you saying, like, have a web page so that, or a link, or a platform, all for, the words? For which? For the... Expenditures. Yeah, I mean, it could be something like that, but um, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. I, I'm just asking only because we, we, you can go onto our checkbook in each district and look at what we're spending our dollars from in the district. Um, as for departments, you can also go the, in the departments. I'm not sure if it's broken down by districts. So that's where I'm asking, what would you right. like to see so that then I can uh, direct or influence uh, staff to say, can you now put a link or a, I don't know, it's not necessarily, I think it's a link or a tab that then, uh, a drop down, that's what it's called, a drop down so then they can drop down and say what year and say what council. I, I think it's more like a, you know, we know what department gets the money. So, for example, like street maintenance, we know that that department gets money. But, you know, like in my neighborhood, Maryville, we don't see that street maintenance. So just to see how, how and where that, that money gets spent. So you want to know where the projects are going 
and how, uh, what area it's getting spent in. Yes. Is that I'm hearing that correctly? Yes, more or less. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Because see, on your speaker card, it said, talks about trauma fund and participatory budget. Well, yeah, <laughs> okay, time. yeah, I know. I got it. I got it. Uh, Jeannie Summer. And then Paris Wallace right after. And then after that in the queue is Ben Laughlin. Good evening. I appreciate being here. I also appreciate the need to summarize comments, but my concern is how they're synthesized. For example, the issues and solutions of the homeless population and the transient population are not the same, but they were combined last year to one word, homelessness. And this isn't fair to the homeless population or to help the transient issues. Um, Having asked and not, not received an answer, I do have one question. If you can tell me how much is allowed it to the, in the budget for community bridges, please. Do you mean community bridges, but also Phoenix Cares? My, mine is just community bridges. The CBI. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate and participate in the libraries, the arts, and our parks. But I did an internet search and checking some references, I, when I started asking what makes a livable city, I found two common threads. One was safe and the other was secure. I don't know the public safety pay and pension issues. I didn't negotiate any contracts. But I really would like to see these issues resolved before the next budget hearing, please. And after being misquoted last year in the summaries, I will keep it simple. Yes to park rangers. Yes to repeat offenders program police officers. And yes to additional police officers with appropriate compensation for new and existing officers. Thank you. My understanding is in the budget there is uh, allocation for park rangers on the flatlands and in the preserves. Eight, okay. Those of us with parks really appreciate having the park rangers. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we are still currently hiring for the police. Uh, we have not met our maximum, and we're struggling in that area. And the third was, <laughs> well, I didn't write it down. I was trying to, I, <laughs> well, listen in texting is hard. One of my main issues is since this how the, the uh, the comments are synthesized okay. because we have, to, like a transient population, the homeless, they're so very different. So there is and a they're difference. both ones we really need to address. Yeah, there is a difference between transient and homeless. Transient mm -hmm. is more of an addiction, a behavioral health. Homeless is immediate mm -hmm. at that point mm -hmm. and have possibly lost a job, uh, health care, a number of items, but right. are willing to get care. Yes. Okay. Yes, please. And once again, for the uh, repeat offenders program. And rope. And rope. Oh, don't worry, <laughs> Jeannie. I was, over, I was talking about it this morning. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Paris. And then Ben. And then after that is Patricia Butler. Good evening. Um, I'm Paris. I am a homeowner here in District 4, longtime resident, lifetime resident. I am... Um, I want to talk about youth programming a little bit and also to touch on the park rangers. Um, what we know is that um, the, what I know for a fact living across the street from a high school is that the youth there don't have anything to do after school. Um, and this ties into park rangers because the park that's directly across the street from their school is closed. Um, there's signs that are posted, actually, that it's closed from, like, 8 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon, and then it's closing again at 9. So there's only a three-hour, four-hour window that they're open. Um, as a parent, if I can't take my child to the park during the day, I don't have anything to do with them. Um, so I know that as, as um, a teenager or anybody really trying to hang out at a park, regardless of what they're doing there, um, not having that access is not helpful. Um, I also know that youth programming, having two children of my own, is expensive, right? There are free programs. Um, however, 40 to $80 per child is really unrealistic for, and I work a full-time job, 
um, it's really unrealistic, um, especially when you have multiple children. And on top of that, when you do have multiple children, each of those children on that team has to pay an additional fee to keep the lights on. Um, for example, for the um, soccer league in like Falcon Park over in that area, they pay $5 a child to keep the lights turned on on the field. I feel like that should be a basic thing that the city provides is the electricity for this. Um, I also know that as, as a as a longtime resident here, that this is the final process in this whole process that's been happening. And we're just getting to be invited into this process. Um, and I feel like as, as somebody that actually pays into the general fund, I should know like in November, when after no, the discussions start, right? I shouldn't be the last person to know. Um, I also wanna talk about more along the lines of park rangers. Um, what we know is that there is one point something million dollars that's actually being um, spent on park rangers right now. And not park rangers in the traditional sense that we're thinking. Um, what, we're, what we know is that they're going to be ticketing, criminalizing, enforcing these codes um, that aren't helpful to youth, to houseless population, to all of these people that actually utilize the spaces. Um, what we could be doing with that money is um, opening and unlocking the restrooms, right? At the same park that I'm describing, the restrooms are locked, padlocked with giant bolts um, all day long, right? All evening long, even when there's games going. I don't know if this is an unmanned park. I don't know if it's a forgotten about park, but those need to be unlocked. Um, so my child doesn't just pee her pants when we're at the park um, because we still go even though it's locked. I just want y'all to know. Um, I also know that a similar park in my same neighborhood, in my neighborhood, they are broken equipment. Um, I can tell you about my neighbor whose child slid down the slide, cut his leg open on the slide. So I mean, there's a lot of things that could be fixed and all of the money that we're spending on criminalizing could be spent to fixing up these parks. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Falcon Park is, uh, is secure, I guess, or closed from eight, I wanna say to three, but I, I think it's three. It's closed from eight to three because Carl Hayden has asked us uh, and other community members have asked us to close the park from eight to three. There is gang violence and drugs running through there. I personally have stand with you in the sense of these parks should be open. Um, what does that look like? Uh, this is one of the solutions that the parks uh, dialogue has happened and it happens through the parks board. Uh, through the parks board, the city does not, as even though I was the chair of the parks, uh, it's the parks board that has the authority to mandate or deliver these type of, uh, of direction. Mm. Um, so I do know about uh, Falcon Park. I am very well aware of. Uh, Carl Hayden talks to me, the principal and everybody around Carl Hayden talks to me about it. Um, I do believe that, uh, I do believe that there should be safety. Um, what does safety look like? That's a bigger conversation, uh, but uh, access to bathrooms are necessary. Uh, but also access to bathrooms also means that uh, we want it safe and clear. Sometimes that's not what happens. And so I understand. Mm -hmm. So I will uh, discuss that with the parks and the parks board. Thank but thank you. you. Ben? Um, my name is Ben. Uh, I've been living in Phoenix for about five years, always in District 4. Um, I actually live... Thank right you. At, uh, yeah. um, I always live, or, uh, live right across the street from Carl Hayden right now. Um, okay. And that park is uh, 8 to 4.30. It's closed. So, yeah. Um, also, Jeff, I really like your budget presentation. So if you want to send it my way, I'd be all right with that. Um, yeah, I've seen it a couple times myself. Um, I need your email address. All right. There's a few things in the budget um, that are actually really concerning to me. 
uh, almost all of them have to do uh, with how we're choosing to invest in jobs and departments that end up criminalizing poor people and young people and people of color. Um, I see a lot in this year's budget. The theme has been making a stronger, stronger Phoenix. Um, and that's super exciting to me, but I think we have to really talk about how we're doing that. Um, so we could be using that money that we're investing in those other jobs and departments uh, for things like affordable housing that you've touched on, expanded library hours. I've been to budget meetings and been hearing uh, library supporters saying we need expanded hours. Um, and I want to back that up as a person that has two step kids. Um, and we also need free programs for youth, kind of like Paris was talking about. Um, and this is because these are the kind of things that actually make our neighborhood strong. Right. Library security doesn't make our neighborhood strong. Park rangers that will essentially be used as park cops will not make our neighborhood strong. And continuing to dump millions of, uh, millions of dollars into the police department for dang sure isn't going to make our neighborhood strong. I have two young stepkids who are black. Uh, when my wife and I were figuring out where we were going to rent and then buy a house, I wasn't looking at crime rate statistics. I was looking at how many officer-involved shootings had happened in that neighborhood in the past few years. Laura, I'm sure you know. Your district had the most shootings last year. Yeah. Um, and right across, on the other side of the 51 here was the, the beat that had the most shootings, right? Um, my hope is that city council will stop taking the easy way out when it comes to public safety and uh, stop wasting our money on that type of safety. Because um, we need to overhaul how we're defining safety, because this isn't working. Um, if we're going to get to the root of the issues facing our city every day, we need to invest in the young people, poor people, and people of color who live here. Uh, we need actually affordable housing, accessible mental health care and addiction services, and we have to have a say in the budget process from the beginning, not two weeks after the budget's already been written. Thanks. Thank you. Patricia Butler. And then after that is Luke Black, and then Vidi Hernandez. Thank you. My name is Patricia Butler, and I live in the Cherry Lynn District uh, of in 4 and my concerns are small compared to what everyone else's concerns are. They're all very important. But I'm looking forward to a greener Phoenix. And yes, a greener Phoenix in recycling and drought um, mitigation, et cetera. But I'm looking for a green. I'm, I'm the Lorax speaking for the trees. We need more trees and better care of the trees that we have now. Trees will diminish the uh, heat sink that we've formed in Phoenix. They will be enjoyed by all residents, no matter what their economic status is in the community. And we have such a great density that's occur of population occurring in Phoenix right now. Since I've lived here, the number of high rises and apartments that are, are appearing in downtown Phoenix is great, but I think we often miss the fact that those people we're bringing in, we're not adding better streetscapes with safe bike lanes, with lots of trees, new parks. When was the last time we built a new park in Phoenix? Um, and I think we really need to inform developers that we want a streetscape. We don't want to see a parking lot underneath a building. We want stores, amenities, a nicer Phoenix for everybody. Um, and I did hear that we have 19 new planning and development people coming on staff, and I hope that they will look at the planning of Phoenix and see how they can make developers really create a better um, Phoenix, not just for the people that will be living or working in their buildings, but the people who live adjacent to those buildings. Okay, Patricia, you would be happy that we have the Woo Code. We also have the SHAPE plan. Uh, we have another plan uh, that includes all of that. Um, in addition to that, today we spoke uh, policy about, uh, I want to say the heat island, but it, it was the urban heat. Um, and so we had a, a robust conversation regarding that. Trees, the other dynamic was infrastructure uh, for irrigation and what does that look like and what type of trees will survive in our summer. So we had a robust conversation today at the council and passed a... Uh, a plan, a global plan for that area. And we, in, in addition to that, uh, we asked uh, those of us that also represent the west side, uh, uh, west of I-17, for some of that activity to happen on the west side. Uh, because normally we start our plans in the central core and uh, 
for whatever reason, we don't get to the west side or the south side. So uh, four council people have asked for that to happen. Luke Black. So we're working on it. And uh, we have a plan with the developers. <laughs> it's called, uh, uh, I think it's the Woo Code. I can't remember exactly what the plan is, but it's really talking about activation on the bottom. Uh, Patricia, the city spent $2 million on trees last year. Do you know where those trees went? Nobody knows where those trees went. Nobody does. So, I mean, if the city's going to spend more money on trees this year, what's the accountability process? Right. Um, thank you for giving us uh, the opportunity. Thank you for um, recognizing that we, as the residents of this city, have a lot of really great ideas for how this city can become better. Uh, Laura, I'd like to thank you personally for your leadership on the participatory budget process that we're going to see uh, next year. Really excited to see how that's going to roll out. Um, I think uh, as each one of the districts begins to implement that, I think we're going to see a lot of really, really great things come out of that. Um, a couple of things uh, in this year's budget that I'd like to address. Uh, first of all, uh, there is roughly $2.5 million in additional general fund spending that is allocated for the police department. Um, I would ask that the city freeze that funding. Um, for those of you that do not know, the Phoenix police are the most violent police department in the country. Um, last year they shot 44 people and killed 23 people. This year they have killed six people already. Um, we need a, a more accountable, more transparent police department, and this police department has not indicated that they are moving in that direction. Um, so I'm asking that you freeze that 2.5 million. Um, there's 800,000 in that um, 2.5 million that is set aside for uh, booking, uh, for to hire staff to do more booking. Um, as a friend of mine noted at last night's uh, budget hearing in Maryville, you don't need people to do booking if you reduce the number of people that you are arresting. Uh, which brings us to the next topic, which is how the city of Phoenix is approaching um, handling folks that are experiencing homelessness in this budget. Whether it's $339,000 that is given to libraries to, to move folks out of libraries that are homeless, whether it's the $1 million that they've set aside for park rangers, um, or whether it's the $390,000 in the budget that they call street cleaning, which is essentially we're going to bulldoze over people's houses. The city has set itself up to create the criminalization that will be needed to fill the $800,000 in booking that it wants to spend for the police. So if we reduce the criminalization of folks experiencing homelessness, maybe if we move that $390,000 over to CAS, which has been at all the other budget hearings asking for $250,000 uh, for more bed space, we can reduce the amount of people that we're going to pick up and put in our jail system. Um, next, I would um, ask that um, the city fund the trauma fund uh, without funding the additional training for officers because they've already proven that they aren't using that training, so why are we putting more money towards that training? And then, Laura, I have one more thing for you. It's a specific personal ask for you. You voted in 2016 to get the municipal budget or to get the municipal ID up off the ground. That ID has stalled, and I would like to ask you personally to get it kick-started again. City residents need that ID. We've got a budget surplus that we can afford uh, to support that ID, and you can take leadership on this. Thank well, you. Well, let me just answer that. I took leadership on it. I moved it. I got council to move it. And so I am expecting other council members along with me to move it. So... Um, that's where, that's my answer. Uh, VD Hernandez, and then Dr. Robert Cannon, and then Lisa Glow. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the space. Um, I'll just reiterate some of the comments. One, again, that we are really late into this process, and I think we've made that really clear from last year talking about this, that we know this budget is pretty set and that it's gonna change a little bit, so this just feels like a show in many ways. 
um, and that this budget is going to continue. And I also like to point out that as we were sharing what this budget process looks like and what is included in this process, someone talked about it. Oh, this is an attack on homeless community, and I hadn't it hadn't clicked for me until someone brought this up, which in the different ways that we wanted to find safety, just around criminalizing people, finding more fines, finding more reasons, finding more ways to arrest and give people tickets, right? We are all a bill, a sickness, a hospital bed, like so close to not having a home, right? Um, spent all morning like debating a debt from a hospital, um, because I got sick, right? And, and I know that this year alone, I've denied going to the hospital or going to clinic several times because I can't afford it. And so when I look at the ways that we are spending money and calling it safety, talking about you know giving more tickets or fines, that that is not our safety. Our safety is when we are healthy and thriving. And in our communities like Westside and, and Maryvale, um, you know, this, like the trees and all of that, like we're not seeing that. The streets cleaning, we're not seeing that. We have the potholes, the broken slides. We have um, the condoms in the sandbox when kids are playing. Like that's what we have. That's what my niece gets to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And so instead of spending a million dollars on park rangers, we need to re redefine that. And because right here, you know, the description is like to patrol the parks. I don't want park, more park rangers or more police or more any presence patrolling us. Like we have us being patrolled and surveilled all the time. We need that those parks to be cleaned. We need those lights to be fixed. We need those sandboxes to be cleaned and all that crap that's in there to be removed. We don't need more patrolling of our parks. Um, to the municipal ID, right? Uh, there was no budget ever allocated for the municipal ID. And that has been part of why it didn't get started, right? As a community partner that was part of that process, um, we weren't willing to any more front the money because under the new president and an administration, the policy needs to be strengthened to protect all the data, to make sure that people's information is secured, to make sure that the department, because they had not agreed to respect it and enforce it appropriately, for those things to get done, and then for the city to be willing to invest in that process, and as community members who are also willing to invest in that process. Um, as we're looking at this, right, and from the street cleaning, neighborhood cleanups, to the increased security, um, in Maryville last year, we had, or a year and a half ago, um, Mohammed was killed at the library, in the library, because he was a homeless man, he was trying to use the restroom and the library staff denied him access to that. Um, security, right, or staff or whoever it is, um, didn't want to let him go to the restroom and so then at some point, police was called. Um, and in that process, Mohammed is no longer with us. And so this is for us how we've seen increased security or increased, again, patrolling work. It is not about investing and supporting people for, for be, to be healthy. Um, it was a way to remove people and, and hide people and hide the problems that our community is very real and is facing. Um, similar with the mental health crisis, that is a Phoenix issue. Most of the shootings last year were with people who had uh, mental health crisis in the moment, right? Stories like Baco, whose mom called, um, who was having a bipolar episode and was shot and killed. Um, in that process and so it is a priority for Phoenix it must be a priority for Phoenix that we must invest in that priority um, and so to finalize yeah that that's what we are asking for is a reduction of the criminalization that is happening in our communities and a true investment in solutions in redefining safety that safety is not just more codes and more you know arrest safety is having people live healthy, free, and happy lives, and that we deserve that. We deserve basic, dignified living conditions. Um, and that's currently not happening. Um, more money has gone to police, and crime continues to be the same. So it is not working. What are we going to do differently? Thank you. Thank you. I believe um, this last budget, uh, 28 I got to remember 2018 uh, where we par uh, passed the participatory budget and uh, what they're speaking what many are speaking about is the process and the budget process and uh, they are correct 
in the sense that what happens is the budget starts and then everyone comes to the council and says, what are your top priorities? And then everybody, basically the city manager goes to each, each council person and says, what are your top priorities? Where do you want to look at these things? What do you want to look at? And then there's a conversation about the priorities. The other conversation that goes on in a public uh, setting is in our committees and what are we looking at and what are we doing? That's basically how the budget then gets formed. And then the city manager presents the city budget uh, to the public because uh, he hears everybody and then the, and the, the process starts. Then it comes out to the community. So right now we're in the community process. And right now is the opportunity for the community to engage in the community process to say, I would like to look at this, I would like to look at this. And then all the, the transcripts are gathered together and the city manager um, then looks at it and sees what is possible. So that is kind of, that's, that's how the budget process happened currently. Money was put set aside and we just passed it let's see, two months ago, maybe a month ago, a uh, participatory budget, and it's in the budget right now, of 25000 to go to each council to start having a, part a participatory budget process so that the community can come say, come to us, and, and we will have meetings, or I will have meetings. I don't know about my other council. I can't guarantee to anything. Um, one, one council person will say it's a slush fund. I'm not sure what he'll do with it, but in my role, uh, I will uh, have meetings to say I have $25,000, where would the community like to, for this money to go? And that will be a dialogue throughout the whole District 4. So we're starting participatory budgeting. We're hoping that it, it gets up and going and then that we continue and we can add more to the budget. So that's what participatory budget is about. Uh, Dr. Robert Cannon. Good evening, everybody. My name is um, Dr. Cannon. I'm in official capacity as the president of the Willow Neighborhood Association that represents the largest historic neighborhood association in the city of Phoenix. I thank uh, the city staff for being here today, and a special thanks to the men and women in our uniform. Laura, I think you know why I'm here. I'm here to talk about... Uh, Willow the, and... Uh, and uh, Third and uh, fifth? Third and Fifth Avenue. Yes. As you know, as, as being in the middle of a major growing city, the Willow Historic Neighborhood has worked collaboratively with the developments that have been surrounding us. Much to our uh, concern today that we have been working for the last several years with the City of Phoenix on infrastructure, protection of our neighborhood, and specifically, we have more children in Willow than ever before. We have a growing demographic of infants, children, their parents are now scared to take their strollers on 3rd and 5th Avenue. If you look at 3rd Avenue from downtown to Indian School, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you will see the caterpillar of cars that will avoid 7th Avenue. They make the left turn at Indian School to go to I-17. We have been extremely patient, Laura, as you know, with the infrastructure. The 1986 Willow Conservation Plan specifically states the conservation of the historic neighborhoods. And I'm here today to politely ask Laura that the city consider our 3rd and 5th Avenue redesign, which the neighborhood has put together. Rather than ask the city for direction, we have provided a strategic vision to the city to consider not only to protect Willow, but the rest of the historic neighborhood surrounding us because if Willow begins to crumble, it's a serious concern for the rest of the infrastructure of the city. So I, I humbly ask that the city consider our vision 3.5 in the Streets and Transportation Department, trust me, knows who we are. We are uh, maybe have going to win the award for the most speed humps, traffic signs, and I'm not so sure we want each historic neighborhood to have that reputation. Also, as you know, if you watched the news last week, pedestrian, traffic, fatalities, accidents, I think we are the leader uh, in the nation on that. And we need some st specific strategic vision from the Streets and Transportation Department rather than a Band-Aid solution street by street. Thank you. Got it. Um, and I'm going to ask you, since you're uh, the largest uh, 
neighborhood of preserving a historic neighborhoods, uh, there are some homes or apartments right on 7th Avenue and 11th that are up, up to go to be bought and destroyed. So I think the historic preservation needs to get involved. Uh, they're right on, right next to, not ne right, not literally next to, but uh, 8th Avenue, 9th Avenue, between 9th Avenue and 11th. Uh, the apartment's right there on Thomas. Uh, they're historic and uh, there's an outside developer coming in. So, thank you. Oh, no, 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 I'm saying the historic preservation. So I'm asking uh, the historic neighborhoods to uh, come into play in order to preserve them. So, <laughs> well, that's, uh, what, what, what did my dad used to pay to play? He used to tell me, you watch out for pay to play, because that's usually how it, uh, some people w think it's going to happen, and that's not the game he played. So Lisa Glow, and then Monica Goddard, and then Laura Stone. Good evening, Councilwoman and city staff. My name is Lisa Glow. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Central Arizona Shelter Services. We are the largest and longest serving emergency shelter in Arizona located in downtown Phoenix. We serve 470 adults at our uh, shelter downtown and 120 to 150 family members at a family shelter in Sunny Slope. A lot of people don't know about that. Um, 35 years ago we were founded and it was city mayor, Phoenix mayor, Terry Goddard, whose wife Monica Goddard will be speaking after me. So just want to acknowledge that there has been a community and commitment from the city of Phoenix to help with homelessness and we thank you for that. We've done a lot in the last year, including increasing our private fundraising by about 78%. We've increased support from other cities by about 53%. So we've been doing our part to raise private dollars to address the challenges. Other accomplishments this year, we've received some private funding to care for the seniors who are staying in our shelter. 1,200 of them last year. One in three people in our shelter are over the age of 55. Huge majority in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm gonna give you some data on that. We acquired a building in Glendale to be a navigation center for homelessness. Along with that, with a private grant, we hired a West Valley housing navigator because that community is struggling to meet the needs of the growing homeless population. We served over 4,000 people last year. Of those, 1,300 went into permanent housing, and that's with the help of our case management and the support of the city of Phoenix. We served over 500 in our family shelter. We expanded our case management hours to weekends and evenings so we can get people into housing and to end their homelessness. We had over 500 veterans we served. Those also tend to be the most elderly. And at our family shelter, we have a five-star quality first child care program, the only one in an emergency shelter. We are facing this year increased financial burdens. United Way funding went down last year, and we anticipate another cut this year of $236,000. we are um, in need of increasing salaries and benefits. That's another one hundred and ten, And we're facing increased facility charges from the Human Services Campus of about 200000 So that's $546,000 uh, of a budget short fall before our private fundraising. So we are focused on meeting increased needs. There's another increase in the unsheltered population this year, 22% in Maricopa County, and it's been going up every year. We have less shelter beds since the overflow shelter closed, and we're turning almost 400 people away monthly who want shelter at CAS in our adult shelter. So while we're doing all that to meet those demands, we're focused on increasing our program effectiveness. We're expanding our senior housing programs for seniors on Social Security. We're going to open the Glendale Success Center, the Ramsey Norton Center. And we're going to put some beds in Cytocast, Maricopa Integrated Health Services, Dignity are both interested in putting specialized beds for the medically frail seniors. So we're adding 10 beds. That should be coming in the next few months. And um, I'm talking about people with dementia, people who are paralyzed, who don't have a, uh, who've lost a limb, who are blind, who really should not be staying in an emergency shelter. So another part of our plan is to have a separate shelter in the West Valley for seniors and medically frail individuals, and we're working on uh, seeking a legislative appropriation on that end. 
We're doing more to co-locate co behavioral health services inside the shelter. We're recognizing the gaps. So the commitment to really do everything we can so that our shelter meets the needs of the people coming to us. So I'll get right to the ask, since I hear the bell. We're asking for your support of CAS in addition to the support you provide for uh, meeting some of those uncontrollable costs. We're asking for 258000 of the 546 shortfall, and we'll privately raise the other half of the funding. This would give us a tremendous um, relief from the burdens, increased costs we're facing, and the ability to continue to serve and provide quality services while we expand to meet the growing needs. So thank you for your support and consideration. Thank you. Uh, the City of Phoenix, uh, I want to say how much, uh, okay, so well over four million in homelessness goes into homelessness. Do we know specifically for CAS? Because I know every year we've 900,000. So we, uh, City of, of uh, City of Phoenix uh, puts in about 900,000 and about 1.2 into you, Mom. So... Uh, we are uh, we are putting money into homelessness and um, uh, shelter, and so just for the audience to know that there is money going in. Monica Goddard. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Laura, and to the council and to the city manager's office for adding additional hours in your proposed budget for the libraries. What I'm here, though, is to ask you to start to look at the future uh, so that the city of Phoenix, the fifth largest city in the country, can have every library open every day. As you may know, the Friends of the Library, which I'm part of, provides thousands of dollars and hundreds of volunteers each year to library programs, anything from toddlers to teens to STEM or STEAM to Story Hour, as well as uh, help to college students. Uh, we help support College Depot, which is a wonderful, wonderful program. But we can't give all these services to all our citizens if the libraries are closed. And we really need to be have them all open every single day. If you want to look at a missed opportunity, it's this. When companies look at an educated workforce, they start with libraries. We are starting at early ages to make readers, to make learners, to provide all sorts of opportunities. We provide business services. We provide a hub for small businesses to start and use that as well. It is a fabulous, fabulous service, and I think you would all agree. But what we really need to do is look at the next budget so that we're not doing this stopgap every single year. And before the recession, we had all the libraries open, and it's absolutely critical, not just downtown, the one in your neighborhood. We need them open in all locations. So I hope that you will work on that so that we will have that. And for those of you in the audience, everylibraryeveryday.com, get on there and send Act Now to your council. Thank you. So Monica, I, we're expanding library hours in certain libraries. My understanding is that uh, there are still libraries that are closed on... Fridays and Mondays. Okay. I just want to get that on the record. Laura Stone. And then after that, Gloria Gonzalez. And then after that, Manuel Salas. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Arts and Culture Commission, and I want to thank you for your support. I think arts and culture are an important part of what makes Central and Uptown Phoenix a really dynamic place to live. My message is short, to encourage your support of the Office of Arts and Culture and to support the increased funding for the arts grants for youth and underserved communities. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gloria Gonzalez. And while Gloria is walking up, Monica, I've been toying with this for quite some. You can go. You uh, twice, quite some years of, of actually looking to see if possibly moving the after school programs under the library. Um, but that's a larger conversation. But I'm looking at that because I would like to see the after school programs to be really robust and really uh, develop or, or be part of having. Uh, STEAM or robotics, anything like that to uh, expose young kids to different uh, fields. Well, so, think, as you probably know, Councilwoman, a lot of our programs are, can be referred to as in a box where they can be replicated even on a school site if you have a number of the staff. 
Okay. Thank you. Tiana, you know what we're working on. <laughs> Hello, my name is Gloria Gonzalez. I am here representing the Garfield Organization, a neighborhood alliance formed by other Garfield residents such as myself with a sole interest of fostering a stronger sense of community to create a safer and more beautiful and more connected neighborhood. Now, let me tell you why I'm here <laughs> today. In 2008, the city of Phoenix commissioned a preliminary roadway and drainage analysis for 13th Street from Moreland to Van Buren Street to improve drainage conditions. The intent was to develop alternatives for the installation of curbs, gutters, and asphalt along the 13th Street. 11 years later, nothing has changed. Sadly to say, there is still no curbs and gutters so every time it rains in the valley, especially in this area, 13th Street and the cross streets along the proximity, one mile long stretch between Moreland and Van Buren become water pools. Residents frequently deal with flooding as water covers sidewalks and enters their front yards and their homes every single monsoon season. Soon after the rain, but before drying out, residents deal with not only standing murky water, but mold and debris. When the rain water dries, most of the 13th Street is filled with clouds of dust that brings yet another issue to the residents. Those seeking to park next to their own home along the side of the road on 13th Street have been ticketed by the city of Phoenix Police for parking on non-dusted proof surfaces. Where else would and could they park if not in front of their own home? Clearly, these residents are often find themselves in a catch-22 situation that without a doubt would not be tolerated in most communities. Moreover, Garfield Elementary is located on the southeast corner of 13th Street and Roosevelt and has its main entrance along 13th Street. All children attending Garfield Elementary walk through clouds of dust, water pools, moles, and other debris on a regular basis. For those of us who are unaware, Garfield is also recognized historic neighborhood adjacent to other historic neighborhoods in the downtown Phoenix. A long overdue solution has been sought out by the Garfield residents for decades. Garfield has been a neighborhood initiative area for the city of Phoenix since the 1990s. Throughout the year, Garfield residents have been requesting help for their city representatives and other city of Phoenix officials, but nothing has happened. We kindly request that funds be alloca allocated for not only paving, but actually add curbs and gutters for 13th Street. Your support will be much appreciated by all our residents, our children, and senior citizens as myself. So please uh, try to help us. And don't forget about us. You know, it's, it's been too many years. Thank you. How long have you lived in the Garfield area? In, in, in that area, yeah. since I was in high school. Okay, because the McKins used to live there, the Uribes, and I'm trying to think what other families yeah. are in there. Okay, He's all right. There. Um, so I'm going to give you someone's number in the future. Okay, no, uh, someone came to my last meeting at Indian Steel and uh, and showed me the pictures. Actually, they were they loaded it up and everything. So I saw the pictures. I did also see, see uh, what happens uh, uh, to the Garfield School. Um, so I understand and I know now. Um, Mark over here can speak with you. Raise your hand. And uh, we can look at this. Uh, the other piece is, which you're going to get a kick out of, uh, my son, uh, 
had to go to Garfield for summer school in first grade, second grade, and so I know that area very well. Um, or where I put him in summer school. Uh, it's, it's more like I put him, mom put him in there. Um, so understand, I'm going to give you my former chief of staff, uh, David Longoria's number. He now lives in Garfield. He also knows how to move through the system and he knows transportation and streets very well. And so I think you, once you guys join, uh, we could probably see some movement. So I will give you that afterward. Manuel Salas, I think that's your partner right there. <laughs> yes, uh, good evening all, and thank you for letting me speak. Also, uh, I'm from the Garfield neighborhood. I've been there, well, tomorrow will be 66 years in my neighborhood. So, uh, and I'm a concerned uh, resident also in speaking about the the roads that need to be fixed out there, you know, and uh, they're really bad. And my concern is the kids, you know. It's a health hazard, you know, and well, with the residents there. And like I said, I've been living there in the neighborhood, good, bad, good, again, you know. We had our problems there, but uh, we need these roads fixed. I mean, they're bad. And uh, that's what we're trying to fight. And like Gloria said, uh, you know, we since 2008, you know, 11 years is 11 years, and that's a long time. But I hope uh, we could work something out and uh, fix the roads. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm assuming you'll go speak. You'll speak to me afterwards, but you'll also speak to... Uh, Mark, I was going to say Mike, but I was like, no, I know <laughs> it started with an M, but it would. Um, okay, I know I'm going to butcher this name. So I'm going to go Mr. or Mrs. Nelson. Orion. I was going to say Orion, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> and I didn't want to do it, so. She's the last speaker. If there's anybody else that wants to speak, please place a, put in a card. Um, you could be. No. Uh, my name is Orion Nelson. I'm a local attorney and homeowner there you go. here in Phoenix. This is my first meeting of this sort, and I want to thank you for having it after regular work hours. That means a lot to me to be able to participate. And I'm here to ask that you invest in community organizations, groups, and services that will empower, that will create meaningful and important experiences for our community members and our youth. I support so many of the comments that people have made here today for increased support for things like affordable housing, parks, youth programs, mental health and homelessness services, emergency shelter services, childcare, libraries, the arts, infrastructure. These are critical things in a city like Phoenix and they're gonna make our lives better on a daily basis. And I just appreciate everyone's comments so much. And I also understand that this means moving away from a model that overinvests in policing and criminalization. But we know that the criminalization model is not working. There are more fiscally responsible and evidence-based ways to allocate our resources. So I wanted to share a personal story that highlights for me how these budget decisions impact us on so many levels. Um, I grew up in a small community and we didn't have nearly enough resources for services like mental health services. And when I was 18, my best friend became paranoid schizophrenic. And with nowhere else to turn, his family called the police for help. And they arrived, he was arrested, he was charged with a felony, he was taken to our local police, um, our local jail, and he was in solitary confinement for over a year. And this wasn't just devastating for his family and for me, it was life altering for me. But it impacted our entire community because those resources could have been used on so many other things. And he was a young man and he needed help. And so that for me illustrates kind of this larger conversation that we're having 
because we can preemptively do things to help our community and to make us safer, or we can react in a way that I think is really negative and not forward thinking. Um, so, sorry. I'm shocked to learn that 43% of our city's general fund goes to the police department. I support increased accountability and transparency for the Phoenix Police Department. And with all that, I just want to circle back to my hope that you'll invest in positive, meaningful, and important experiences that will move our city into the future. Thank you. Is there anybody else? So. To those last comments, um, I'm probably going off script, or I really don't have a script, um, and I really don't follow it. Uh, what I have to say is that uh, holistically, it's really looking at the systems and all the systems that have been developed. Um, one that is right now in the middle of uh, looking at equity uh, looking at um, what does equity look like, how does it look like, and how is it developed through policy, in the lens of policy. Um, but also one that is a teacher, a former teacher, and still actively involved in the education system, uh, understanding how an education system is very archaic in the sense of how we move to modern times. Um, and how we move to uh, what is happening today and modernizing ourselves and how slow education moves about that. And the reason why I'm speaking about education is because I think one of the keys in, 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 the, in the system, because we all work in systems, you know, you have the education system, you have the university system, you have the city, county, state. That's the one system that really starts with young youth and how do we develop that system and move it so that it's modernized but also modernized in the sense of understanding the times and the modern technology and what they're faced. I am only talking from experience uh, because I have two young kids that are in the, in the, in the system. Uh, a young man Hispanic man that has suffers from ADHD that is labeled through the system. I'm an elected official, a Latina woman that has a master's, that has to fight a system at this moment because my son cannot operate in a way to sit still and operate in a way to learn. So, to those activists, I get it, I understand it, I live it. But I also live in another role where I make decisions and I have to see the bigger collective and understand what the bigger impact is. And so for me, it's very difficult every day in a way, in a budget hearing, to hear we are limited in resources. It is also very difficult when we have a limited budget when I know the impacts of many programs and the impacts of public safety and the impacts and what I mean by public safety is keeping all our neighborhoods safe and keeping them engaged and vibrant so I get it I understand it it's really for me about how do we work together and how do we come up with solutions together and it's not a me, you, me, you, it's a we. And so I understand. And probably 
many of my other colleagues understand, but they operate very differently. I am a woman of the community. I was raised in the community and I will always stay a woman of the community, regardless if I'm a politician. I hate that term, but I am, and I have to embrace it. So as a politician and a woman of community, how do I bring it together? And so what I wanna say is that I wanna thank you for being engaged. I wanna thank you for being here, but I also want you to stay engaged to pull down the, to pull back the onion and create a better system for our community and our future. Because the students, it's not about me now, it's about the youth. I'm aging, I'm getting there, I wanna retire. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm gonna get there yet, but I wanna retire, but I also want the youth that are sitting here listening to be part of the innovation and developing the future. And so it's very important for them to understand the system, but we also have to change the system for the community. Our community is changing and evolving. We're more diverse. We, more ha we have more dynamics and issues, and we have to face them. So thank you. Sorry for the breakdown, but appreciate all your work. Thank you for the employees that are here.